Man, there is no place to be like the house of God. How many of you are with me on that? There's no place like the house of God. I love that verse in uh, the book of Psalms that says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. How many of you know that the house of the Lord, it's a place of expectation. It's a place of excitement. It's a place of faith. And, and I believe that one moment in God's presence is better than a thousand days anywhere else. How many of you are with me on that? How many of you love being in church? And there's no place like church on a Wednesday. Man, you're here in the midweek. You're committed. So, man, congratulations. Thank you for being committed to this. Every student in here, every leader in here, man, I believe in what you guys are doing. This is an amazing ministry, and I love your pastor. I love Pastor Ben. How many of you are with me? You love Pastor Ben and Alyssa. Amazing, amazing. And every time I come, I am blown away by the excellence of how you guys do things and by just the incredible care that your leaders put into. Do you know your leaders care about you? And they put so much time in behind the scenes to make things like this happen. How many of you love Kendall? Kendall's the man, does such a great job. Last time he was organizing some dodgeball thing, and that just deserves to be applauded. He, his life was in danger, and uh, that's what I know. But no, I am, my name's Josh, like they mentioned, and uh, I'm just honored to be with you. I am from Faith Family Church. I serve under some of the greatest pastors on the planet, Pastor Mike and Barb Caminetti. I've been going to church there since I was two years old, and I'm 35 now. I am a product of a local church that cares about young people. I'm a product of a great student ministry and a great youth pastor who put in time and effort to make sure that we didn't just have a youth group, but we had a youth ministry that was alive, where God was moving, where the Holy Spirit was moving. And so I'm so grateful for that. Now I have the privilege with my wife, Jillian, and our two kids, Jude, who's seven, and Weston, who's four. I think they have a picture they're going to put up. Yeah, that's my squad right there. And uh, we have the privilege of leading our Fairlong campus. We were in student ministry to high school and college ministry, and then our pastors asked us to, to lead this campus. So right now we're leading a campus campus and we're just having a good time and here's here's what I need from you I need you to know this that Jude who's seven and Weston the small one that's four he he is he's a little crazy Jude is a straight arrow our seven-year-old right he's like a straight arrow by the book he's up at like five every morning shooting jump shots on his little tykes by like by like 5.30 breakfast, he wants it on the table at 7.15. I'm not even kidding you. He is that structured. He is just like my wife. Weston, our four-year-old, he's a little crazy. We need your prayers. Come on, somebody. He is crazy. And uh, this morning, just an example, he set his little tykes like car right by my bed where I was about to get up. And so I got up. And man, I wiped out because his car was right there. And then he came in all with this smirk on his face like, good morning, daddy. And I was just like, yeah, I see you. I see you. You put that trap there for me. I get it now. But we have, we have great kids. And I'm so grateful. One of the greatest privileges I have is the privilege to be a dad. But second to that, one of the greatest privileges is to serve in the local church. And so if I can encourage you with anything before we get started, long-winded opener, serve in the local church, get involved early. And let it be a huge, huge part of your life. Uh, I believe it's vitally important, and I believe it'll keep you on the right course. But I'm going to get right into it tonight, if that's okay. Is that okay with everybody? Did you come ready to take notes? Did you come with something to write with? Did you come with a Bible? Did you come with a notebook? We say this at the United, at our student ministry, we say this, that note takers are history makers, and that a dirty Bible leads to a clean life. And so we believe that you bring your Bible, your notebook, your pen, and a friend to church every single week with you, and you're going to be all right. So we're going to talk about this from this subject tonight, and man, I believe that this I believe that this message, if you'll listen and if you'll apply this to your life, it has the potential to completely change the course of your life. And so I'm excited to preach tonight. I hope you're ready uh, to receive from heaven. So here we go. We're going to get into it. We're going to talk from uh, the title tonight, Change Your Thoughts change your life. Change your thoughts. Change your life. Turn with me, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. Proverbs is known as the book of wisdom. And if you read a proverb a day, uh, 
you'll be wise, okay? You won't keep, I was gonna say you'll keep, uh, you know, something away, but you'll be wise if you read a proverb a day. I love Proverbs because it gives you these little nuggets of wisdom that help you to live your life. And so I'd encourage you to read one, but it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, or as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As a person thinks in their heart, so are they, or as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. How many of you know you become what you think about the most? How many of you know your life goes in the direction of what you think about the most? Your thoughts are vitally important. Turn with me now, flip over to 2 Corinthians. We're going to look at verses 10, or chapter 10, verses 4 through 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 5. It says this, it says, since the weapons of our warfare, not of the flesh, but they're powerful through God. For the demolition of strongholds, we demolish arguments and every proud thing that's raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive, or we take every thought, everybody say every thought, every thought captive to obey Christ. Like I mentioned, thoughts are so important. In fact, they determine the very course of your life. I could say it this way, if you don't like the direction your life is heading, then change what you're thinking. Look no further than what you're thinking about the most. Why? Because what you think about the most produces the strongest emotions in you and strongest desires in you. And out of those emotions and those desires, that's what we talk about. That's what we end up doing. That's how we end up living. We end up moving in the direction of our thoughts. And so if you can change your thoughts, you can change your life. If you don't like the direction your life is heading right now, can I encourage you? Look at your thought life. Look at what you're, what you're thinking about. I'll never forget junior high. It wasn't really, it wasn't really like my time to shine. I wasn't nearly as cool as you guys in like between seventh grade, eighth grade. I had some rough times. It was just rough. I refer to it as the turtle years because I kind of looked like a turtle and it was just weird. And uh, so then ninth grade came around and I, it was a little better, but, but not that much. And all of my friends were older. Can anybody relate? All of my friends were like a class or two ahead of me. And so I'll never forget, we were hanging out on a Friday night at my one friend's house, and we're just there, and they got this bright idea. Do you guys know like the, uh, the coffee tables that are like the long coffee tables that it's not like a dinner table, but it's like a coffee table. You like put your drinks on it and things like that. And like, it's right in front of the couch. Well, my one friend's mom that we were at his house had this coffee table. And my friends got this bright idea that they were going to put me on the coffee table and shrink wrap me to the coffee table. Now, I know I don't strike you as a bodybuilder, but don't let these skinny jeans fool you. I'm scrappy, man. I can go after it and uh, I can knock somebody out. No, I can't. Okay, so there were like four or five of them. There was one of me. They held me down pretty easily. They wrapped me up in so much of this stuff that I literally could not break free. I couldn't get out. And then if that wasn't bad enough, they decided this. They decided, hey, we're going to take him to not just the neighbor at the end of the Rhodes house, but, but the angry neighbor. Do any of you have an angry neighbor? Don't raise your hand. Hopefully you'll see him in church someday. You know what I'm saying? But the angry neighbor's house, all the way at the end of the road. They carried me all the way down there, and they put me on the porch, rang the doorbell, and ran away. Couldn't believe it. I'm trying everything to break myself free from this shrink wrap that has me stuck to this table. And after a while, you know, you get a little claustrophobic. It took forever for this dude to answer the door. But what I heard was more startling than the door opening itself. What I heard was deep dog barks. And, and I had a traumatizing time as a child where, where it made me kind of afraid of large dogs, especially when I can't move. And so I'm thinking like, oh no. Like, this is crazy. And the dogs are like, hoo, hoo, hoo. Like, you're like, did he just do that? Yes, I did. It's fine. I have the microphone. You don't. It's good. But these dogs are going crazy. And literally, it's taking like two minutes for him to answer the door. And finally, he answers the door, not because he wants to, but because he's irritated because his dogs are going crazy. And so he's mad already. Remind you, he's the 
angry neighbor, not just the neighbor, he's the angry neighbor. And he pulls that door open, rips it open, and he looks at me, and I'm already like just trying to over apologize for the situation. I'm like, sir, I, I am so, I am so sorry. I, I don't wanna be here any more than you want me here. Like, I don't wanna be here right now. My friends did this to me. I'm like trying to compensate. I'm trying to, I'm trying to apologize, and he's just glaring at me, and he says, you need to get some new friends then. Boom, he slams the door and leaves me there. I'm still shrink wrapped to the table. So then I'm like just trying and I'm feeling even more claustrophobic. An hour later, my friends came back and I didn't see them first. You know, it wasn't like I like saw them. I heard them first. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you guys are, are, are real funny. You're like hilarious. They finally let me go after, after an hour. Finally, I was able to get free. I had tried everything to break free from that shrink wrap, but I just couldn't. I couldn't move my arms, I couldn't move my legs, and I couldn't break free. I get the feeling maybe some of you are in here tonight, and there have been certain thought patterns in your life that you just, you wanna break free from them so badly but you just haven't quite been able to break free. The Bible calls these things strongholds. It's when you've entertained a pattern of thought for a long period of time and the enemy gets a hold on your mind that's called a stronghold. And, and I believe in here tonight, the good news is this, that I believe that God wants to set you free from whatever stronghold is on your mind. Some of you, for as long as you can remember, have been questioning your worth. Some of you, for as long as you can remember, have been thinking that you're not enough. Some of you, for as long as you can remember, have been feeling like you're less than, feeling like your life is meaningless, feeling like your life has no purpose. And your toxic thought pattern just seems like, man, it just seems like my mind just gets bombarded. And it seems like it's the same thing. And it seems like it's my area of struggle all of the time. And I believe that God wants to help set you free tonight from those strongholds, but here's the deal. We're not just gonna get set free tonight. We're gonna learn from the word of God how we actually stay free. Because God can set you free in a moment, but it's up to us to stay free by doing the word. How many of you know that to be true? So I wanna share with you three things, three things tonight that I believe your thoughts have the potential to do. The first thing is simply this, your thoughts, your thoughts, they go ahead and shape your world. My thoughts, they shape my world. In Proverbs, looking back into the book of wisdom, verse four, verse 23, it says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. You've heard it said this way, guard your gates, guard your heart, guard your eyes, guard your ears, guard your heart, because out of it flow the issues of life and it determines the course of your life. How many of you know this to be true, that there is a battle that's going on in your mind? There's a battle going on in your mind. See, the enemy knows this to be true. He knows that Jesus already won the victory for us over 2,000 years ago through his death, burial, and resurrection when he reigned victorious and said, I have the keys. I've been given these keys. I've been given the keys of authority. Whatever, and I'm gonna give those keys to you. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Here's the keys. So we already have the keys to victory that Jesus has won for us. So the victory's already been won. A battle doesn't need to be fought, but there is a battle in our minds. And the enemy knows that the only way that he can defeat you is if he can get you so discouraged and so distracted through thoughts that are coming to your mind that you never actually step into the potential that God has for you and you never actually live out the purpose that God has for you. But I believe tonight there's a group of young people in this room that you're going to come to a revelation of I can't be defeated and I won't quit because if Jesus won the victory for me I'm going to walk in that victory I'm going to win the battle in my mind I'm no longer going to be held back by some of the things that have held me back in the past but I'm going to get my mind right and when we win that battle in the mind the enemy that's why he'll stop at nothing to continue to attack our mind have you ever noticed this have you ever noticed that the very thing that, that is your weakness, 
that you get attacked in that constantly. Maybe it's that sin. Maybe it's that thing that you can't overcome, that temptation that you think you can't overcome. Maybe it's that insecurity that you're so self-conscious about. I don't know what it is for you, but here's what I know. The enemy does, and it seems like he just attacks, attacks, attacks. Why? Because that's his last chance of desperation to get you discouraged, to get you distracted, so that you never actually walk in your destiny. And I believe this to be true, that when we learn to win the battle in our minds, the enemy doesn't stand a chance. We aren't fighting a battle for victory. We're fighting from a place of victory. So really, we're just enforcing a victory that Jesus has already won for us. But it says that guard your heart because out of it, out of it flow the issues of your life and it determines the course of your life. I believe in order to stay the course, stay on the path that God has for you, to stay the course, we need, we need to control our thoughts. The second thing is simply this, that your mind and your thoughts, they need renewing. Your mind and your thoughts, they need renewing. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and if you can, I want you to write that verse down. This is an important verse, important passage. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Can we pause there? Can I, can I remind you and encourage you that you're not your own? that you've been bought with a price, that you don't actually have the right to do whatever it is that you want to do, but you've been bought with a price. You belong to the one who paid the price for you. God, through Jesus, he sent Jesus as a ransom for your life to pay the penalty that should have been yours, and he bought you with the blood of Jesus. Therefore, we don't have the choice to live however we have a free will. We do have a choice to live however we want, but but ultimately, once we get a revelation of this, I belong to him, we start to realize because of everything that he's done for me and because I have a revelation that I belong to God, I no longer want to live the life I once lived. I want to live a life that is pleasing to him. I think you know that you're growing spiritually and you know that you're maturing in your walk with God when you stop asking what's permissible and start asking what's pleasing. God, what's pleasing to your heart? I don't just wanna know where the line is. I don't even wanna come close to the line. I just wanna be pleasing to your heart. I wanna be in line with your will. It says to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. I love this because it says, but be transformed. Everybody say transformed. By renewing your mind. The word transformed comes from the Greek word metamorphosis. And it's basically to take something from one state into an even better state. It makes something that was once one way, it makes it even better. So it's not just transformation, it's beautification. It's not just transformation, it's something great that God wants to do. It's that same thought as a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It's something that wasn't that great, then turns into something beautiful and great. Can I encourage you that God wants to turn your life in to something that's beautiful, that's something that's great, to something that glorifies him and shines a light on the one that you're serving? You weren't here to be a part of this culture. You were here to bring kingdom culture. And once we understand that we're here to bring the kingdom of heaven down to the earth, we start to live a little bit different. But one translation of this says, hey, don't fit into the customs and behaviors of this world without even thinking. How often do we fit in without even thinking? I believe this is a word for some of you. Stop trying to fit in when God's called you to stand out. There is something special on your life. You are anointed. You are equipped. You are graced for such a time as this. And God has called you to stand up and step out and shine a light for the world to see. But it only starts when we start renewing our mind and we allow that transformation process to take place. How does this happen? We have to identify where every thought is coming from. We have to identify where it's coming from. Because in, 
in 2 Corinthians, it talks about this. It talks about in verse 5, it says bringing into captivity. And that means taking every thought as a prisoner of war and interrogating it. And asking, where did this come from? I think with every thought that enters your mind, you need to ask yourself, does this line up with the word? Does this line up with what God says about me? Does this line up with his word? Because that'll give you a great filter on what you allow in your mind and what you don't. See, we have to be really, really cautious of the thoughts that we entertain. Some of you, your life is going in a certain direction, and if you trace it back, it all started with entertaining certain thoughts. Some of you have gotten into a life of compromise, but if you trace it back, it all started with entertaining thoughts. Some of you have had thoughts of, man, my life isn't worth it, and, and I just, I don't like who I am. And, and if you're honest, that all started with you entertaining those thoughts. It started with entertaining the thoughts. So we need to identify where each thought comes from so that we can take it captive. And it says in 2 Corinthians that we cast down imaginations or any high thing that tries to exalt itself above the knowledge of God. What is the knowledge of God? It's found in his word. So we need to line every thought up and say, and interrogate every thought and say, is this from the word? Does it, is it from God? Does it line up with his word? And if it doesn't, can I encourage you? You have every right to handpick your thoughts. You can cast some of them out and say, hey, I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to think about that. I reject that thought. I'm not going to allow myself to go there. I'm not going to entertain that thought. It's not enough to reject the thought. You have to replace the thought. You reject the thought, but then you replace the thought. What do you replace it with? You replace it with the word of God. We have to get the word in us so that it becomes our strongest reality. Some of you, the strongest reality has been the lie of the enemy that's been attacking your mind, and that lie has placed a lid that has been a limitation on your God potential. But I believe tonight that the lid needs to pop off. I believe that the lid needs to come off so that you can experience all that God wants to do in and through your life. It starts when you get a reality of the truth that trumps every lie. It starts when this becomes your reality over the lies that you've been believing. See, some of you were given a label, and that label, you've allowed it to limit you. We've all, if we're honest, I remember high school, middle school, I even remember in college being given a label and being told something about myself. And one of the things was, hey, you should never speak in front of people. Like, you're the worst public speaker I've ever heard. I had a college professor tell me that. You're going into business, it looks like. Please have somebody else give the, the, give the presentation. You shouldn't give it. Have somebody else give it. Because you're quite possibly the worst public speaker I've ever heard. I thought to myself, oh, man, that didn't feel too good. And I remember feeling like I got kicked in the stomach. But then I walked out into the hallway. And I felt like God started to deal with my heart. The very thing that people say you can't do is what I'm going to use you to do. I just need you to trust me. And for some of you, for some of you in this place tonight, you've been buying a lie of a label that was put on you, and you've allowed that label to be a limiting factor in your life. And I believe that God wants to blow the limit off tonight. I believe that he wants to blow the lid off tonight. I believe that that limitation that's been on you because of a thought that you've entertained is something that God wants to deal with at the root so that you can live the life that he's called you to live. There is nothing that the enemy can do to stop you from fulfilling the destiny that God has for your life unless you allow him by entertaining his thoughts. I wonder, and I was thinking about this the other day, I was thinking about water and like the water filters that they put on, on sinks. You guys know what I'm talking about? And I think there's something about those. They catch all of the contaminating things so that your water can be purified so that it can actually be good for you to drink. And I was thinking about this, and I was like, man, what if we had that same type of filter for our mind? So all of the things that would contaminate, we catch those things, and we don't allow them into what we take in. I wonder what would happen. 
See, because I believe if we would get that about ourselves, where we have a filter with every thought, where we identify every thought, we don't just identify it, but we reject the thoughts that are coming from the enemy and we replace them with thoughts that come from God, I believe we would actually live out what God has called us to live out. I believe it's then that we would start to see God do everything that he wants to do both in and through our lives. And I don't know about you, but I don't wanna leave any of my potential here. I wanna do everything everything that I can for the kingdom of heaven. I want to do everything that I can for God. I don't want to get to the point where I'm in heaven with Jesus and say, hey, I left a little bit there. No, I want to be like, hey, I gave everything I had. I, I fulfilled everything God called me to do. I didn't allow the enemy to lie to me. I didn't allow him to limit me, but I told him where to go. And I didn't fight the battle with my mouth shut I started to open my mouth and speak out the word of God. How many of you know that right thinking, it leads to right believing, and right believing will always lead to right speaking, and right speaking and right living go hand in hand. When you're thinking right, you'll start believing right. When you're believing right, you'll speak right, and you'll live right. But it all starts with thinking right. The third thing is simply this. My thoughts are my responsibility. My thoughts, they're my responsibility. I was thinking about this, and I mentioned my wife and I, we lead a, a campus. It's our Fairlawn campus. We started it in October of 2019, so right before 2020, right before the pandemic and all that. But anyways, I get up super early. It's about 40 minutes away from our house, so I get up super early. We have two young kids, so like, you don't want to wake up the kids. And I'd rather not wake up my wife on Sunday morning. So I would do something like um, get up at like five and they don't get up till like seven on Sundays. And I would get up at like five and it'd be pitch black. And I'd be trying to like search around, like trying to get like to the bathroom, trying to get like then to uh, the closet and get my clothes out. And, and have you ever hit your toe on like the end of the bed? or like the dresser or things like that. Did that a couple times and it's just like you do that, you're like, thank you, Jesus, that was awesome. Some of you speak in a tongue that needs no interpretation and I just wanna say we're all at different places in our journey. <laughs> Might wanna work on that. But anyways, we, I, I hit my toe. So I, I found this thing um, on, my, on my phone, the, the, the flashlight. And I started to go ahead and use this flashlight because because I found I needed it not just to protect my feet, but also when I got to my closet, I would try to pick stuff out by like feeling it. So I would like feel a denim jacket and I would like feel, oh, I think that's the right shirt. And I'd get out into the light and I'd realize, man, like my clothes don't match. Like that's not good. I can't go to church with my clothes not matching. And then I'd pull one shirt out and be like, oh man, that was before the quarantine 15. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's crazy. I definitely can't wear that to church. And so I started using this light and, uh, and I started like shining it like right in front of my feet so that my feet um, wouldn't be harmed, so that they'd be protected. And so that I'd have a light all the way and I'd just illuminate the steps all the way to the bathroom. And then I'd leave it on the stand right there. And then when I got down to the bathroom, I would pick it up and I'd go into the closet. I'd close myself in the closet and I'm shining the light. Now I can see. And I told you all that because I just wanted to tell that story. I thought it was cool. I'm kidding. I told you all that because in the book of Psalms, it says that the word of God, it's a lamp unto our feet and it's a light unto our path. And, and here's what I've found. If you want to walk on the path of protection, if you want to walk in the path of provision, and if you want to walk on the path of purpose, then you're going to need to shine a little light on the situations in your life, on the thoughts that you're having, you're gonna need the light of God's word to help be your guide. Otherwise, you're gonna find yourself putting on the wrong things. You're gonna find yourself putting on things that just don't look good on you. You're gonna find yourself putting on comparison. You're gonna find yourself putting on pride. You're gonna find yourself putting on things that were never meant for you. The Bible says be clothed with humility. The Bible says, put on the mind of Christ. See, there are clothes that were meant for you. But here's what I've found. It's hard to get dressed in the dark. It's hard to get dressed in the dark. You've got to shine a little light 
so that you can see, so that you can go ahead and walk in protection, walk in provision, walk in purpose, and clothe yourself with the right thing. We live in a culture right now that things that are stirring up in them are fear, anxiety, depression, comparison, disunity. But I believe that our minds need renewing, not just renewed once, but they need renewing continually so that we can go ahead and exude peace and faith and humility and unity and things that go totally against the way that our culture is going right now. See, if you try to get dressed in the dark, if you're trying to navigate things in the dark, it's going to be difficult. And the world that we live in, it keeps getting darker and darker and darker, does it not? The culture that we're in, it keeps getting darker and darker. But guess what? The, the darker it gets, the brighter the light shines. And so as God's word illuminates your path and keeps you from harm. Most of the pain that we feel is when we get off of the right path. Most of the pain that we experience, there are things that happen and there are situations and storms and circumstances. I'm not saying there's not. And Jesus said that we would go through some of those things. Those things are real. But I've noticed that a lot of the pain that happens in our lives wouldn't have happened if we would have just stayed on the path. The regret that you feel because of the party, the regret that you feel because you just slept with somebody, which here's the good, here's the good news. There's grace for all of that. There's forgiveness for all of those things. But that doesn't mean we can just go on continually doing them because we can't continually do the wrong thing and expect to get the right results. We can't continually do the wrong thing and expect to experience the right type of things in our life. We can't keep doing the wrong things. At a certain point, we've got to live by the light. And each step that we take, God illuminates a path for us through his word. For every problem that you face, there's a God-prescribed solution found in his word. And I believe that the word will teach you how to live. It'll teach you how to live a life that stands out. It'll teach you how to live a life that's separate. It'll teach you how to be holy like God's holy. It'll teach you how to be the Jesus follower that he's called you to be. Because here's what I've found. There's a lot of fans of the movement, but there aren't a lot of followers because following usually costs something. But I believe in a dark world. We can shine the light. Every situation, every thought, everything that comes, shine a little light on it. Because it's hard to get dressed in the dark. Some of you wonder why you're so angry, you're so bitter, you're so full of pride. And I wonder if it's because you've been trying to get dressed in the dark. You believed a lie about yourself. You've bought, gotten so bought into culture. And I believe that if you just open up the word and find out how much you're loved and find out God's purposes for you and find out how much he loves you, find out that you're his masterpiece, that he created you for good works, that he prepared for you long ago, that his thoughts towards you are more than the grains of sand on the shore. If you would find out how much your God loves you, and the purpose that he has for you, you'd be clothed differently. All of a sudden, some of those weights of things that you've felt and ways that you've tried to prove to people that you're worth it, you wouldn't need that anymore. Why? Because you'd know your true value. Because your identity can only be found in him. Your satisfaction, some of you have been looking for to be satisfied. Man, I just want... I just want my life to be fulfilled. I want to be satisfied. I just want my life to be satisfied. The only way to truly be satisfied is to be surrendered. But see, here's the deal. Everything that God created, everything that God designed, the enemy tries to distort. And so the enemy wants you to buy a counterfeit instead of what God created you for. 
And so that's why we have so many things that people try to fill voids with that can never fill voids. That's why we have so many people walking around angry, with hurt, with pride, with bitterness, with offense. We have so many people walking around with those things because they bought a lie and they're chasing a counterfeit. That's why we have so many people who will give up their purity in a moment because they think it's going to lead to satisfaction, but in reality, it only leads to more emptiness because everything that God designed for a purpose, the enemy tries to distort and distract you with so that he can keep you discouraged because ultimately his goal for your life is he wants you defeated. He doesn't want you walking in destiny, but man, we are people of destiny. That's why it says this. It says in Philippians 4, 8, it says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, is anything excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. Is it true? Is it excellent? Is it praiseworthy? Think about all the things that we get caught up in within our culture. Think about all of the things that don't really matter that much that we treat like they matter so much within our culture. That's a ploy of the enemy because if he can get you focused on what doesn't matter much, he can keep your focus off what matters most. Ask yourself, is it true? Is it lovely? Is it of a good report? Is it excellent? Is it praiseworthy? Here's a good way that you can identify if it comes from God. Because you have the ability. It's our responsibility and we have the ability to choose our thoughts. If it causes you to think less about yourself, less about others, or dream smaller, it's probably not from God. If it causes you to think less about yourself, think less of others, or dream smaller, it is not from God. But if it causes you to think, believe the best about others, if it causes you to think highly of yourself, and it causes you to dream bigger, guess what? It probably is from God. And I believe for some of you tonight, you've talked yourself out of in your mind a dream that God's placed in your heart. And I believe that tonight, God wants to breathe life back into dead dreams. I believe that tonight God wants to set people free from some strongholds that have been going on for so long, as long as you can remember. Right thinking starts with right thinking, which leads to right believing, which then leads to right think is speaking and leads to right living. I'm going to have the band come back up and help me out. I'm going to have them go into a, a song here in a moment. But I believe that what we say is so vitally important. How we live, we need to stay on the, on the path where the word, it illuminates, it lights up our path. And we stay on that straight path, the path of surrender, the path of being set apart. But how many of you know what you say is important? How you live is important. What you say is important. And I'll never forget this. Some of you may be going through a situation in this place that seems impossible. I feel compelled to share this story never forget, I was packaging, working a packaging job in college. And uh, there was this kid that had like everything going for him, it seemed like. He was like running cross country. Do I have any cross country runners in here? Okay. All right. Awesome. I mean, let, let's be honest. Cross country runners, a little, bit, a little bit different than the rest of us. They like run 80 miles a week. I like drive 80 miles a week, right? And that's different. And so this, this guy that I worked with, he, he ran like 80 miles a week. He was on scholarship at a college. He like was living the college dream. He had a Toyota Corolla with low miles. That's like the college dream. High gas mileage, low miles, Toyota Corolla. Come on, somebody. You guys will understand in a few years. And uh, so he had this car. It's in nice shape. It's a good car. But he would always make this statement. Man, it's just like there's something black. It's like there's this black cloud. It follows me everywhere that I go. And when it rains, it pours. And he'd say that whether it was morning, whether it was afternoon, 
or evening right before we went home, he would say that every single day at some point in the day. And I'd be looking like, bro, you all right? Like, you good? You want to talk about it? Okay, I'll just keep packaging, you know? And he'd say that every day, man, it's just like something black. It's over my head. It's like this black cloud just keeps following me everywhere I go. And when it rains, it pours. In a three week span, I've never seen, I've never seen it play out this way, this drastically. In a three week span, I watched him go from somebody that was running on a scholarship, completely healthy, with a really nice Toyota Corolla with low miles and high gas mileage, to he wrecks his car. He was all right, thank God. He wrecks his car, they total it. They don't give him what it's worth for him to replace it with another one just like it. He doesn't get that worked out with the insurance company. They give him less than he feels like the car's worth. About a week later, he injures his leg and he's unable to run for like a full couple months. And when you're running cross country in college during that training time, it's a huge deal. I could list off, I'm not, I kid you not. I could list off thing after thing after thing after thing that literally just kept going wrong in this young man's life. And finally, he just kept saying, man, it's just like something's black, something black. It's like this black cloud. It follows me everywhere that I go. And when it rains, it pours. And finally, like I'm packaging, I'm passionate, but I'm trying to like hold it in, be respectful, you know, just like mind my own business. And finally, I'm just like, hey, I, I gotta tell you, like, you might wanna stop, you might wanna stop saying that. Because obviously like saying that isn't working out very well for you. But here's what I believe, that what we think about the most, it produces the strongest emotions and desires and beliefs within us. And what we think about the most gets in our heart and we get full of the most. And what we think about the most, it becomes our core beliefs. And it's out of those core beliefs that we speak it's out of those core beliefs that we live. It's out of those core beliefs that we do everything. When pressure comes, it's out of those core beliefs that we react. I heard a college professor say it this way at Bible school. When pressure comes, you're like a tube of toothpaste. What's on the inside of you will come out. And I believe that one of the things I've been so challenged with is when I'm feeling pressure, what's the first thing that comes out? Is it the negative thoughts about myself? Is it, is it thoughts of I'm not gonna make it? Is it thoughts of how is this gonna work out? Is it thoughts of God, where are you? God, don't you care? Or do I go back and I say, no, the word says this. The word says that I'm an overcomer. The word says that I'm his masterpiece. No, the word says that he's already won the victory over everything that I would ever face. The word says, that no matter what comes against me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. The word assures, the word assures the victory. If I can win the battle in my mind, the word assures that I can walk in victory. I believe tonight for some of you is transformational because you, you, you've thought that this is something that you're just gonna deal with for the rest of your life. You didn't know that God could set you free and then that you had the control to actually stay free. And one of the things that I think is an issue in some cultures is we teach the wrong thing. We teach that God is just gonna take care of everything and I don't have to do anything. But the truth of the matter is, God has given you his word and he's not gonna renew your mind for you. Your thoughts are your responsibility. You've gotta have a desire to put his word in for it to become your reality, for it to renew your mind every day so that you can tell the enemy, huh, I can't be defeated. I'm not gonna quit. I know through Jesus, I've already won. You're defeated. You have no place here. You have no right here. I win. 
The end of the story is that I win. I don't know about you, but I like winning. Like there's something about being on the winning side. And that's why I love serving Jesus. Because if I just get his word in my heart as my reality, nothing can shake me. That's why Paul, even though he was shipwrecked, you guys all know who Paul was in the New Testament, wrote two thirds of it. Even though he was shipwrecked, and even though he was stoned, I know that's nothing like your Thursday morning is, but like it's still kind of bad, right? Shipwrecked and stoned, he was able to make statements like this. None of these things move me. None of these things move me. How was he able to say that? This, what was in him, the word of God was more of a reality. What was in him, who was in him was more of a reality than the circumstances going on around him. Can I tell you, you are dangerous to the enemy. You're dangerous to the gates of hell when you have an understanding that greater is he that is in you, that there is something in you that you know you have a reality of. In his word, it's in you in abundance and it comes out as the overflow of God your good. I know this that I will see your goodness in my life. I know this, that no matter what it looks like, I have the victory. When your family member gets the diagnosis, he said that by his stripes, we were healed. When you're feeling that anxiety, you'll know that the Bible says, cast all your anxieties on him because he, he cares about you. There is no problem that you will face. Young person, hear me. There is no problem that you will face that there isn't already a God prescribed solution in his word that the Holy Spirit will remind you of right when you need it most. But he can't remind you of the verse you've never read. I believe that one of the things that is so needed in our culture right now is we need a revival of the Bible. We need people who get passionate about the word again. We need people who understand that the word, it is God breathed, it is alive, it is active, it is God speaking to us, it is light and it is life and it is what we need. It's what we need to walk in all that God has for us. And I don't know about you, but I wanna walk in everything that God has for me. Will you stand to your feet? What I wanna do in this moment is we're gonna begin to sing out. And for some of you, this is an opportunity for you. Maybe you've been holding back something from God and this is gonna be your opportunity to just throw, give it all away, to just let go of everything you've been holding on to so that you can gain everything that He is. See, humility says this, God, I wanna do it your way because you know best and I want your results. But pride says, I'm gonna do it my way because I know best. But guess what? That leads to your results. Some of you have been trying to do it your own way for too long and it's, you're gonna let go. For some of you, you've had a stronghold in your mind that you can't break free from. And I believe that you're gonna get set free in an instant. I believe the power of God is gonna fall in this place. How many of you know that where his presence is, his power's available? And you're gonna be able to reach out and take whatever you need, whether it's healing, whether it's freedom in your mind. The Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear or anxiety, but a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. Some of you haven't thought soundly for so long, but tonight that's gonna to break free. You're gonna be loosed. You're gonna be free in this moment. So can we do this all across this place? Lift your hands. Lift your hands as a sign of surrender. Say, God, I'm letting go of whatever I've held on to, and I'm grabbing hold of everything that you have for me. And we're going to sing out. And I want you to sing out from your heart to his tonight.